Ahoy Captain, let's talk exhaust gas heat recovery economic assessment, or in other words, money. In the next few minutes we will show you a tool to quickly make an economic assessment for heat recovery systems, in particular exhaust gas heat recovery. It's a mouthful. And in the second part we will also show you a little bit more detailed knowledge that we found on exhaust gas heat recovery systems, in case you want to know more. So without further ado, let's dive in. Here you see uh, the tool that we made and it's uh, free to use. It's quite a lot of information. So let's go from top to bottom and explain you what it is in order for you to get a result on your economic assessment. Here we have the uh, fuel price, your fuel price per metric ton, the installed power of your vessel and the heat exchanger cost. As you can see, we make some, uh, well, you don't see it, but we make some uh, assumptions there. We have the investment payback time, in this case 1.4 years, and two different kinds of visualization, I'll show you later. And here we have the uh, payback, uh, well not period, on the vertical axis we have the amount of money that you make or that goes out. First year is your investment, and then we have a 10 year period in order to uh, visualize. We also have the capex and opex breakdown and some more parameters which we will get to. First of all, the fuel price. Well, the fuel price is together with the uh, carbon tax if you want to add it uh, one of the most important parameters probably uh, here we see a lower fuel price will uh, then it will take longer for your investment to return or get back or make money the higher the fuel price of course the more lucrative your investment is because for these cases uh, the more fuel you save of course the more money you can make and exhaust gas heat recovery is all about reducing fuel consumption so let's just uh, leave it at uh, 400 at the moment and then we have our installed power that's uh, 6500 here you see it doesn't really affect your uh, payback period it doesn't affect your total price and here we see the assumption so let's go uh, well let's go we'll change it a little 6000 and we're going to uh, increase the cost for the heat exchanger and there you see the well the cheaper the easier it is for you to get your money back and let's just uh, leave it at a million for now we will get back to the assumptions in this case we have 2.1 years of payback period and uh, we also have a different view which is a little bit more comprehensive but here we see on the vertical axis the maximum investment cost for the this fuel price in order to get your investment back within two years so for example if the fuel price is 400 euros here we go then the maximum investment cost to get your investment back in two years would be about 600,000 euros. But if the fuel price was a lot less, so 200 euros, then the maximum investment, well, obviously, would be 300,000. So this gives you a quick insight into the maximum amount of KPEX you can spend in order to get a two year investment period. But I like this view better because it's, uh, well, it changes uh, more neatly and it's uh, nicer to look at. So. Let's go to the capex and opex breakdown there we go a few of the same parameters we can also change fuel if we want it doesn't really change much uh, we make some assumptions on your fuel consumption we make a lot of assumptions in that sense but we'll get to it and this one's important because your eu ets price is basically your carbon tax that you pay on top of your fuel so if we bring it to zero you see it's going to have a big influence on your payback period if we're going to bring it to 150 then well yeah of course you're going to implement these kinds of heat recovery systems so just for the sake of argument we're going to leave it at zero for now and here you see uh, the opex breakdown per day or per year and that's quickly a, a quick estimate for you to see uh, how much money you can make with these kinds of systems and there i'm going to slide back from zero to 70 roughly 70 or 80 it is now so you can see that the difference in uh, in your opex per year is almost 200,000 if you have a carbon tax of 70 euros which will well, you can never guess the future but that's probably going to be the case in uh, 2027 or at least then uh, EU people people ship owners sailing around in EU will pay 100% uh, allowance back to uh, zero euros more parameters well what we can change here is uh, mostly the heat exchanger cost itself and some vessel parameters uh, what we assumed here is that your engine maximum continuous rate is at 80 percent all of the time so you need to discount for that if you have a different operational profile this will be sailing for the entire year 
And we also have engine efficiency and we're gonna see what that does. If you have engine efficiency, a higher engine efficiency means basically you have less heat that you can take out of your exhaust. But it only changes it a little. So this together with the heat exchanger conversion efficiency, uh, it mostly changes uh, the amount of money or the fuel reduction you can achieve and that directly translates into the total amount of money but doesn't increase or decrease your payback period. And here we can uh, change the um, heat exchange size, but that's uh, mostly correlated with, with pricing in effect. And as you can see, if I change, if I add 50% of the cost to the heat exchange, it is only gonna uh, increase my payback, uh, payback time for about a year. So still a lot of, uh, still a big influence, but again, fuel pricing and EU ETS are the biggest will have the biggest impact on your payback period and that's it you can uh, i'll make sure to uh, add the link in the description and uh, just contact us in case you have any information any information any questions information would also be nice now let's get back to uh, the second part in which we will explain a little bit more about heat exchanges for those who want to know more about it before we show you what heat exchanges are, let's start with the why. Why would you want a heat exchanger and why in some cases does it make good sense to do so? If we take a regular diesel engine as an example, then, uh, well, maybe not so regular, but a marine diesel engine on the left hand side, we we'll see 553,279. That is an example in which uh, an engine, diesel engine for uh, propulsion has 53 megawatts of installed power this is these numbers are all in kilowatts and on the right hand side we see the useful energy that's taken out of that combustion energy from the diesel engine and you see about half of all the energy is used for propulsion and the rest of it is all heat well mostly and that's partly going into the jacket cooling water of the engine the lubrication oil and scavenge air for the diesel engine those are low temperature um, low temperature heat sinks and those are less suitable for exchanges heat exchanges but we also have exhaust boilers which are used to heat the fuel in most cases and our the rest of our exhaust gases which we are focusing on at the moment and even then if you have heat sources that are not suitable for heat exchanges we still have almost 10 megawatts of power available well available is a big word but at least 10 megawatts of power just goes out straight off the exhaust so, as you can see, in most cases, about 50% of your combustion energy is used for propulsion. And that's why heat exchangers make a lot of sense, especially for diesel electric vessels. So, what do they look like and what are they? Marine heat exchangers are, in that sense, not very different from land heat exchangers. Here we see two, two different types of heat exchangers. On the left hand side, we have a direct model, on the right hand side, we have some tubes. But basically they both have a lot of tubes through which the working fluid goes and in the exhaust gas scenario the heat exchangers need to pass through either the exhaust channel or wrapped around them to collect heat from the exhaust gases. That are, or that are, that's marine heat exchangers. And then we do something with that energy to make it useful energy. We can make useful heat out of it or we can make electricity. But before we do that, we need to hook it up to the exhaust. As I mentioned, uh, we can also hook it up to the cooling water of the engine. This is uh, courtesy of uh, Alpha Laval. They have this picture of a setup in which the main engine waste heat recovery boiler is connected to the main engine. And also auxiliary engine waste heat recovery boilers are connected to the exhaust heat gas. Exhaust gas heat. I'm still, still struggling, but uh, we're going. We're, it's working. It's working. And these uh, power uh, the oil-fired oil boiler and they increase efficiency of overall uh, ship systems. We can use that heat as well to power a turbine, in which case we get electricity. So we convert the heat to electricity if needed. And this is an example from the company uh, Climeon, which I find a very nice example. Up to 355 kilowatts of energy can be produced, electrical energy, from exhaust gas heat. Now, I don't know exactly how much exhaust gas is needed, but they can tell you everything that you might want to know. 
and then going back to the first part of course once you have the information from such a client you can use our tool in order to get a quick estimate of the economics to see if it makes sense from your wallet standpoint from third but not full from a third or dynamic standpoint it usually makes sense if you have space and uh, of course the, um, the systems that are suitable uh, for it on board your vessel and that's it that's heat recovery systems for you so make sure to check out the tool if you need it and you can at any time contact the help desk to clarify your questions have a great day